Hey, it's 7.24 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 28th, 2022 years from something. Today, I actually want to address um, a topic, an issue. It's not new. It's been around for a long time, actually. Uh, I remember first seeing this theory probably back around the time I first started doing more serious research. So we can say, we can say I probably saw it first, maybe six, seven years ago, something like that. Um, back then, I really didn't have the tools intellectually to address it. Um, <clears throat> I listened to uh, quite a bit of of this theory mostly from a guy at the time who was um, popularizing it I suppose you could say uh, his name was David Voss V-O-S-E and I, I think that he probably covered most of the uh, the big strong points I suppose that the theory has now he is by far not alone there have been a lot of people who have gone down this road and though i was unable to really address it then i knew that at that time um, all of my desires not considered we're just talking about thinking about it because i did think about it every every theory i come across I do spend a, a pretty good amount of time thinking about it. Now, some of them I don't think take a lot of thought to diffuse. Some take more thought to diffuse, okay? Um, this one took more. But I think it's... I think it's really a, <clears throat> a bad theory uh, in the sense that I think it's destructive and I think it... I, just, I honestly, I think it's really destructive. I think it's destructive, first off, um, for one's own personal journey of growth. And I also think it's destructive if, if any of these people are having any influence over others. That's where I come in and take serious issue with it. Because we have to be as responsible as we possibly can be if we have influence over others and you know those people especially the people that are maybe more talented in various ways or have a greater mastery of their intellect in various ways um, they're they're necessarily going to have more influence over more people the more influence you get, the more accountable you are for the things that you are saying, teaching, espousing. So in, in this, I am going to name the person who I've most recently seen this with, but not in a way that's inflammatory, nasty. There's nothing, nothing, there's nothing really, there's nothing particularly personal in this. Uh, I do get personal with, with some people um, that I know maybe personally or don't know personally because the things that they're doing or saying or whatever, um, they have a personal effect. I mean, in fact, uh, sometimes I think it's ridiculous how few people, or let's just say how many people actually um, say that certain things aren't personal when actually we should take, I think, far more things personal than we do. For instance, I put it to you this way. If somebody, I whatever, I, I was out in public somewhere or doing something, whatever it is, and somebody who was, let's say, a hothead, um, couldn't control themselves very well, and was intemperate, tried to start a fight with me, a physical fight, a fist fight or anything else, okay? I'm going to take that personally. 
I will take that very personally, beyond what they may think it is. Maybe to them, it's just them flying off the handle and a fist fight. No big deal. But I've been in enough and I've seen enough to know that those things can go really far, even if you don't mean them to. That's why, for instance, there are provisions in the law that Yahweh gave to Masha, Moses, about, for instance, fist fights. If people should get into brawls and certain things happen, there are guilty parties because he wanted people, first off, to think twice before they picked a fight because they were being intemperate. You see, if somebody does that, I'm going to take it far more personal than maybe they intended. Why? Because even a fist fight is a direct threat on not just my health, but the well-being of my family, my loved ones, potentially. It could be a very big threat to their well-being. What if I got seriously injured? Couldn't work, couldn't function, like I normally do. I take that personally. So there's a lot of things that we should take far more personally than we tend to say that we do. Now this one, I do take it personally. But at this point in time, I'm going to address it as something that because there are some pretty darn bad actors out there who I believe have purposely cooked this one up and the way they present it is actually a number of them present it in a very slick way. I'm not saying this person means to do that. I'm saying the people who have come before this person, I don't believe they had good intentions. And I think that they have presented this in a way that if you're not paying attention to detail and rationally thinking this out, uh, you're going to be taken in by it. And it's very destructive. And I think it's a great example of not thinking things through. Um, yeah. We'll dive in. Now, this actually comes from uh, the foundations of this come from some threads that I saw posted or posts on Facebook in a group and the posts were in a group called scriptural truth and lies which is presided over by uh, a woman named Golan G-O-L-A-N-V Waya W-A-Y-A I believe and I'm sorry if I mispronounce that Golan why? Yeah. A few days ago, she had um, posted, and I'm in that group because there are posts on there uh, that that I appreciate. Okay, this is not something where I'm part of the, the the group to be critical or something. I don't really join groups for that purpose. But, uh, anyways, so I saw this post about. Um, her saying that the God of the New Testament was not the God of the Old Testament. Now, the thing is, I agreed with that, and I added a comment essentially saying, yeah, you know, there is a serious problem with harmonizing or reconciling the God we see in the New Testament with the Old Testament in a number of ways, because I see a number of departures in a number of places in the New Testament from the God of the Old Testament. And I don't mean like further revelation departures. I mean serious uh, philosophical departures, um, serious prophetic departures. If you look at the whole of the Law and the Prophets from Genesis to Malachi, if we're going to go in that order, you look at those 39 books and you can even, if you have to, you can even include Esther. You're going to see a consistency, an overall consistency of um, ideas throughout the, the reason for selecting the children of Jacob specifically. And of course, his father, Isaac and Abram, because there's that uh, 
there's that genealogical uh, ascendancy, descendancy, uh, all the way back to Noah and then all the way back to Adam. Now, once this nation of Israel is established, there are certain specifics concerning the law that wasn't invented at the time. It existed. But there were, I would say, obvious additions to that because they had a lot to do with um, the civil life of Israel as a nation, um, essentially running the place as a certain specific government under Yahweh. They also had certain provisions, um, Levitical provisions, because this was a new thing. So there were new things, there were different things, because of the situation that was about to be entered into. But the law in general was not a new thing. This was part of a covenant with a certain people. This covenant was going to be used to reveal Yahweh by his relationship to this people over a very long period of time. And the dynamics of them oftentimes going astray and him still choosing to love them, them oftentimes not keeping the law most of the time, him choosing to love them, him disciplining them, them continually whoring after uh, the ways of other peoples and their gods and their philosophies and so on and so forth, him disciplining them, choosing to love them, finally him casting them out of the land that they were promised in condition that they keep the law for a very prolonged period of time and then bringing them back and finishing the process he promised them <clears throat> that he would affect in them over a very long period of time. These themes are repeated again and again and again all through those 39 books, if you include Esther, of what we call the Old Testament. And there are sharp departures from all of that in the New Testament. So when I agree with somebody when they say that they see a real difference in the God of the New and the God of the Old, that's precisely what I mean. There are significant and oftentimes very depressing departures. Um, however, uh, then uh, Golan began posting these, um, these ideas which I am familiar with and have seen for a long time from a number of other people, um, it, not just insinuating but outright saying that the God of the Old Testament, that is Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament is indeed evil or a you know a satan or something like that and is not the god of the new testament and i'm afraid that most of this is based on really shoddy uh, sort of word selection and then trying to line up um ideas from the new testament passages from the old testament and juxtaposing them in a positive light against things they juxtapose in a negative light from the Old Testament. It's, you have to be extremely careful in how you present all of this, and it just can't be supported if you look at everything in, in a, for, let's just say, for yourself, and just consider how possible these things are. The one thing I, I want to, maybe a couple of things to stress even before I look at some of these posts. One thing is this, the idea of duality, which most of the people that support this um, scheme, um, they support this idea of duality. And what, what do I mean by that? Duality is first and foremost, because it has to be, duality is a pagan concept at its root. It has to be. The reason for that is, if you have a being, an entity, that has the power and the wisdom to create this whole realm of creation that we know uh, that we exist in, um, being spatially, 
uh, and time, and they sustain the whole thing as well, and they have the power to do all of this. They have the power to tell us what's going to happen long in the future, and it happens because they preside over the space they have created, and they preside over the time in which passes in this space they created. Now, when I say space, I don't mean outer space. I mean the space within a contained realm they've created. Because all of the language in the Bible leads me to believe that we live in a contained realm. It's contained spatially, and it's contained as far as time goes. And this one who made it all absolutely presides, has total, complete power and control over everything about his creation because he created it. He created time, which we are subject to, and he is not. He created the space we dwell in, which we are subject to, and its laws, the physics and everything. He is not. If you have one that's powerful enough to do all of that, then you necessarily cannot have any sort of duality. There cannot, absolutely cannot exist a yin-yang. You cannot have the, the good God and the evil God. You cannot. If you had a powerful good God and a powerful evil God, you would necessarily have to have a God above them that was all powerful and all sovereign who allowed the good on the one hand and the evil on the other. You would have to. There's no duality. Anything that people consider evil, and you know, I even covered this in bringing it all together. The word that is most translated as evil is ro or ro -e. Sometimes it's translated as, as, as evil, and sometimes it's translated as shepherd, and sometimes as neighbor or associate. We've got a problem there. Also, you'll find that as you read through the so-called Old Testament, evil, this ro or ro -e, is subjective. Now that's really important. The reason that that's important. When it comes to us, something befalls us that's terrible. We could call it ro. We could, you know, if that was the best word for evil. Or we could just use the word evil. Some evil has befallen us. And you'll see in the Old Testament plenty of people that actually use that kind of terminology. Evil has befallen them. Sometimes they are referring to things that Yahweh brought about, and they're saying it's something evil. While well, they're certainly not calling him evil. Not in the way we think of evil. The way we think of good and evil today is entirely pagan and entirely incorrect. Since he is the sovereign... First off, he has no competition. Forget that. Absolutely forget that. He has no competition. Secondly, if he speaks subjectively, and you have to be careful when you read through the so-called Old Testament, if he is speaking subjectively and he's calling something evil, it really is. Because when he speaks subjectively about things as as good and evil, he is, since he is the sovereign, he's also speaking objectively. The only time a man can speak objectively in those terms and it be correct is if he is speaking precisely of the same mind based on, for instance, the law and prophets, things that Yahweh has handed down to us as good things or evil things. So I don't want anybody to get confused that, that there's any sort of duality that exists. The idea of Satan. Okay? Now, first off, it's not supported that an actual individual, the great Satan and devil, even exists. If you go through the Shathan, that's the word, you look at its occurrences and the contexts, 
and you look at its cognates because there are other words, same exact glyphs, Shethan used in other ways. You'll get a very good, a good sense of how it's used and how there's no way it's possibly talking about, you know, the Lord of Darkness. In fact, Yahweh goes on in a few, at least, books of the prophets to take credit for the quote-unquote evil that befalls us. He brings the good and the blessings. He brings the bad and the evil. If you don't like that, sucks to be you. Because that is exactly the way reality works. When you live in a realm that was created by and is presided over by an all-powerful being. And we don't have to spend forever talking about the specifics or what exactly is implied by all-powerful. He is all-powerful over this realm. That's all we need to know. And it would appear historically that nothing else has had any significant effect on this realm. So we can trust that he is extremely powerful no matter what else we might want to fantasize about or imagine. We can definitely, I think we can really anchor our intellect and our understanding and our faith on that. So, to approach this in some way like, you know, a good force or entity and a bad force or entity, not a great idea. And, and if we look at the witness of the Bible, throughout specifically the Old Testament, we're going to see that the greatest evil does not come from Satan. It comes from man consistently over and over and over and over. And why is that? Why can that be allowed? Because I know there are people that make philosophical arguments about that. Why? How can it be all good? If he allows this and there's this evil, how can he be all powerful? Well, because for one thing, if he creates a realm, a realm that is a closed system that is subject to certain rules that he exists apart from, he can enter and he can do whatever he likes within it, though he doesn't do that much, but he can. He exists outside of it. He has created a space, physical space with rules and laws, including time. And he can allow things like people going their own way, not obeying his laws, his rules, anything else. He can allow that. It's a closed system. So it's not as though whatever we do, and I mean, you know, well, let's say, I guess logically you could have, you could have the great Satan eh, running around with his pitchfork and eh, convincing you to watch the porno, and you would still have that in a closed system, and he would still be only as powerful as Yahweh would allow. So we have to understand that. There's, there's no duality. He is all-powerful period. He brings good. He brings evil, according to our perspective. Always have to pay attention to the context, who's speaking, and who it refers to. Now, so you probably already know, this is the idea, as I, I think I did mention, that the God of the Old Testament is actually like more like a Satan figure, and that the God of the New Testament, the Father, is the good guy. Which that idea breaks down if you just go through the quotes in the New Testament, reference them to where they first appear in the Old Testament, and notice the huge amount of those quotes in which... The God being talked about in the New Testament, since in the New Testament you're pretty much only going to see Theos in the Greek. Sometimes you'll see Kyrios, but because of whoever um, imposed Greek upon 
all of this, whether it be the Old Testament scriptures in the form of the Septuagint, the New Testament, and the New Testament, at least some books seem to be first written in Obery or at least Aramaic or Aramaic. But whoever did, they tend to mostly overlay the Greek word theos onto either Yahweh or Aleim, and not so much Kyrios. You don't have that distinction like if you go into the Old Testament, you'll see Kyrios. It's, that's one way you can tell the Koine is not original and very inorganic is because there's not a consistency between the two in Koine Greek. However, I digress. You go to the New Testament, you look at all of these quotes, you'll see Theos. Reference your Old Testament passages. You'll see sometimes Aliyim, sometimes Yahweh. But they are definitely talking about Yahweh when they're talking about God. The God, the All-Powerful, the Good Father. They're talking about Yahweh. That is one of the easiest ways to deflate this idea that the God of the New Testament is the, this good guy, the loving father, and the God of the Old Testament is not. He's a bad guy and he's mean. Now, there's more ways to do this. I mean, beyond just, you know, some, some little technical things that I might do on, on posts, which I could do this with. There's so many people out there that have pushed this. I'm not picking on Golan. Trust me. Uh, no reason to, to dislike her at all. None. Um, but I dislike this idea very, very much. We could just go, we could just go and we could read the prophet. We could, we could read the law and the prophets and see how he relates to people without cherry picking things that help a, an idea that maybe we want to be true. You know, one of the things that I think about when I think about how good and it's such an inadequate word for me to even say good because it's impossible for him to be evil. That's the other thing. Like we think of good and evil. It is impossible for him to be evil because why? He's sovereign. He is absolutely sovereign. He's sovereign in his being. His whole being is life power, sovereignty. He can't be evil. He can't do anything evil. Everything he does and decrees cannot possibly be evil because he does it, he decrees it. And if you look at his nature, you will see that it's impossible that he go against his nature. It's who and what he is, it's impossible for him because of his nature to act duplicitous or double-minded like we do. Our nature is duplicitous and double-minded and we live in a closed realm subject to time restraints, spatial restraints. He does not. We are duplicitous. He isn't. It's impossible for him to do something evil because he is sovereign. No matter how we may perceive anything, it is impossible for him to be evil. He's sovereign. Do you see how that works? If everything you do, everything you command, has the effect of being the truth because you are you are the ultimate the buck does stop with you you're the ultimate period you can't do something evil in fact i'm going to go as far as saying he could never do something against his nature because it's impossible there are things you ever heard those people that theorize like hey 
Do you think God could uh, make a rock that was too heavy for him to lift? Um, yeah, he pro probably, probably not. Because that's, first off, kind of stupid. But it, it's literally, if we're talking about someone or something's actual nature and substance, he's not duplicitous like us. That's part of the problem with our condition, is we can be so double-minded. He's not like us. So yeah, I, I don't think, first off, I think he's got better things to do. But yeah, I don't think he could uh, make a rock too heavy for him to lift. I'm just going to go on the record with that one. I'll tell you a good story that illustrates, in my mind, how good and decent he is. And I guess this is where we get to the part where I take it really personal. Because I have been through some pretty rough stuff for years, for years, in many, many, many ways. And I know I'm not alone. A lot of people have. I get that. But I've been through plenty. Not for a moment do I blame him as though he has been unfair. I may not understand why. Why did this happen? Why am I oppressed in this way? Why are these things not working out? Why don't I have this? I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. And that's fine. You cannot understand. And I don't understand a lot of things. But the one thing that I've consciously been aware of, and so I've consciously done my best to not even approach doing, is to somehow accuse him of being unfair, doing something not right. And trust me, I have questioned him, especially when things have been sometimes their hardest. I certainly have questioned him. Um, I'm not trying to compare myself to, to Job. I'm sure he was a far better man than, than me. Um, I would imagine if I got answers that they would be probably as rough as the kind that Job got. Concerning his questions. But I'm just preempting what I'm about to say with that. I haven't had it soft. I haven't had a nice... But there's good reasons for it. I certainly do believe that. Because I know that suffering, depending on who it's for, there we get to the subjective part, is often so productive. Suffering can be so productive for some. For some. For others, it can be just destructive. That's important. I think about, for instance, the prophet Jonah. When I'm thinking about the goodness of Yahweh, short book, pretty pretty well to the point. Based on what we see concerning Jonah in uh, the records, so the book's Kings, we know that Jonah lived in the northern kingdom during the time when Ashur, Assyria, had been making war pretty consistently on uh, the tribes of Israel for some time. They were not known as the nicest folks. And they were probably very good at war. And I would imagine any of the Israelites they carried away, they put into foreign lands and slavery. They probably had a terrible, terrible reputation. So Yahweh comes to Jonah at the beginning of this book that's being written. I don't know if by him or just about him. Yahweh comes to Jonah and he tells Jonah, 
I want you to go to Nineveh, or Nineveh, their capital city, which was a great, huge city. And he says, I want you to prophesy to Nineveh. So prophesy to Asher. And when Jonah hears that, Yahweh wants me to go to Nineveh, prophesy to these people, these people that I fucking hate. And he probably did. He probably hated them. If I was Jonah living back at that point in time, with the experiences that I currently have, the shape that I see the world in, I think I would know to a degree how he felt and how upsetting that would be for him. He was livid, livid angry. Because he gave the reason. Actually, Jonah gives the reason within his book. The reason that instead of going to Nineveh and prophesying to them as Yahweh told him to do, he heads out away. He hops on a ship and heads in another direction. Interesting, too, the book says that he left the land he was in, Canaan. Why? It says to get out of the sight of Yahweh. There's numerous times when through the prophets, Yahweh says, I'm going to cast you out of the land, out of my sight. It's interesting. Because his goodness was, I would say, palpable in the land that we once lived in, that we currently do live in. So he goes, gets on a ship, goes in another direction. Why? He says why. He says, because when Yahweh told him to go and prophesy to Nineveh, he knew right there and then that the people that he had probably been hoping maybe much of his life would finally see judgment, would finally be destroyed, and he'd have some satisfaction in seeing that. Who knows how much harm they brought to the people that he knew and loved himself, he knew that when Yahweh said that, that there was a very, very strong possibility that he was going to forgive them, that they were going to repent, he was going to forgive them, and they would now have a lot more time, and would probably be the hand that was brought down ultimately upon Israel, which they were. He didn't want to go because he told him, he said, I know, speaking to Yahweh, I know you are full of loving kindness, forgiveness. He's full of grace. He's full of mercy. I know that myself. Jonah didn't want to go because he knew that there was a very strong possibility that they were going to repent and Yahweh was going to forgive them. And that's what happened. That's why he set up shop outside of the city. He wanted to see maybe they won't repent because he didn't, he didn't care. He went and did what he was supposed to do begrudgingly. And as soon as he was done doing what Yahweh told him to do, and he knew he wasn't going to end up in a fish's belly, or whatever it was, he went and he set up camp outside of the city <clears throat> to see if maybe they didn't repent. Because he was absolutely going to get that show, and he became, of course, very distraught because they did repent. And Yahweh, in his loving kindness upon a people who probably didn't deserve it, which is most people that he's oftentimes so kind to. It's people who don't deserve it. This is why, and I know this from personal experience myself. This is one of the reasons that I take it personally. When people start accusing him of being evil, take it personally. But in a purely intellectual manner, 
Let's just look at a post. I know I've gone for a little while, so what? Get over it. Let's look at a post. So we have a post here, which brings up some ideas. And the two ideas that we're mostly focusing on have to do with wording. Now this is really tricky territory when you start getting into wording, especially the wording that's being used by modern translations and being backed up by organs like Brown Driver and Briggs, Strong's, Thayer's, Jacinius, kind of the impetus of it all. It's very interesting that his name sounds so much like Genesis, who is the foundation of, of all of this bad stuff that they use to support these bad translations. So we have a, a box up here at the upper left that points out that this word, which if you take this word, it is the E, the U, or U, and the E. If you take that and you put a Y or E on the front of that, you have the essentially um, masculine verbal version of this e u e, e u e. Now they're calling it hova because they're using Masoretic pronunciations. They're also using Masoretic lexicography in this because I guarantee you I could run a search on e u e and find all kinds of occurrences of it outside of just the name Yahweh. But this is what it, Golan is, is doing, is comparing this e u -e, which they call Hova, to Yehweh, the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and my God, or Alayim. Now, the funny thing about this is, H1943 is this e u -e. Here's H1943 I've got pulled up on Esword. The first thing is H1943 only has a grand total of three occurrences. Three occurrences in the entirety of the Old Testament. Um, the name of Yahweh has somewhere in the neighborhood of like 6,838. I have to double check. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. This is an absolute minority uh, amount of occurrences here, okay? And the two passages that it's found in, if you just read through them in context, you will see, and if you cross-reference this um, e u -e, and you can use, for instance, you can use my exhaustive obery by glyphs roots chart, which doesn't have the e u filled in necessarily, but something you're going to find is this extremely close relationships to, to roots that either have an inserted U or U or an inserted E or Yad or Y in them, and ones that say phase between this U, U, and the Y, E. You'll see it a lot, okay? You can use this, even though I don't have many of these spaces filled in, I am giving you reference numbers and oftentimes a number of other references that you can use to find out a lot of information on this. One of the things that you'll find out is how closely related e u -e is to the verb, or sometimes it's used as um, kind of an adjective or even adverb, uh, being simply a state of being. You'll see that in Genesis chapter 1 within a few verses. If that, it is the most common verb used just to state that something is. That something is. And this e u -e is actually used in other words that have connotations of something being, existing. A reality. So if you look at this word in context, for instance, of these only appears three occurrences, only appears in two verses. One is in Isaiah 47 11, the other is Ezekiel 7 26. And if you look at that in context, you will see that for one thing in Isaiah 47 11, 
it's absolutely, I'm not going to say is, but you can see how it absolutely could very well be just referring to something that is a thing. It is a matter that exists, something. And they chose to put in mischief. The translators chose to put in mischief. It has been singled out via the Mazora, Masoretic Nakud, and given its own entry in Strong's. Brown Driver and Briggs followed Jacinius, which follows the Mazora, and I would call that suspect to begin with. So there's nothing about this Ehua that should lead us to believe that it is a word signifying anything dubious whatsoever, more like signifying something that just quite simply is. Just like the name E Yeue, Ehue with the E on the front. That is active masculine is being a matter. Yehue. He is. He is. That's why he says, I am. He is. Yehweh. Now, the other thing is talking about this word, which is sene, and referring to the fact that it was called a thorny bush, this H5572. Just a couple of things about it. One of the easiest things that anybody can do to check uh, words, doesn't look like I successfully typed that in. Try again, 5572. There we go. Sene. The first thing you want to check concerning like how accurate might this, whatever the official organs like BDB, Thayer, Jacinius, Strong's, those, those are the big ones. And almost everything else that exists out there is almost like a cheap copy of them. And go back to Jacinius. That's where you're going to find mostly your root source of, of most of these copies. Something you'll find about this Sene H5572 is first off, it appears six times, and this is important, just like the last one. Five of those six times is in the context of Masha Moses seeing this Sene, which appears to be on fire, right? Well, let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry about my nose. It's a little, it's like allergies. It got cold in Michigan. Well, it got warm and then my allergies, um, and then I got cold again. So then now it's cold, but my allergies are still like, <sniffs> and I don't like to take pills for allergies. I don't like to take pills for anything. So I'm going to have to figure something else out. I did get eucalyptus oil, which actually that helps a lot, but I'm a little bit stuffed up right now. Um, so, anyways, in this Exodus 2, 3, and 4, it says, Uyira, so he saw um, Malak, um, a messenger or something, you know, Yahweh, Malak Yahweh, messenger of Yahweh, um, Aliyu, uh, Belabat Ash. So, it would appear that we're looking at a fire burning within, okay? And then it says from uh Matuk, so like in the midst of eh, Sene. Um Uyira uh ene, so he was like surprised and he paid all of his attention to it now because he said Esene. So he said to himself in a sense, see, behold, uh Esene, this word Esene. Um Boar, which they say is also like burning fire. Um, I've never really studied that out, but it has the ba'ash, which is kind of repetitive if boar is also burning fire. U'esene, um, ayananu, um, akal. Anyways, something seems to be burning and he's giving it attention. This is while he was out keeping the flock of his father Jethro. He noticed this thing. It said that he was on the edge of a particular wilderness when he saw this, okay? All of the occurrences five times is in this little passage in Exodus 3, 2, and 4, and one other time, Deuteronomy 33, 16. And this is during a blessing that Masha, Moses, is giving to Yusuf or the children of Joseph. Now, what's interesting about this, I'll just read the King James. It's close. 
and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. H7755, sorry. Sene. We don't know that that's bush. We don't know that that's bush, first off. And the thing is, how many people would stop if there was a bush that was kind of on fire, especially if they were in the Sinai and the bush was really dry? I mean, things like spontaneously combust sometimes in an environment that's super, 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 super dry. That would not be that weird to me. They've recorded things spontaneously combusting in this super dry environment. It happens all the time because these, these people <laughs> that preside over Palestine, they're trying to make Palestine seem like the biblical land of Canaan. And it's not. So they're planting, they're trying to plant forests over there and they put, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and I'm congested in my chest, too. My gosh. They plant pine trees and conifers over there, which gets so dry. They get so dry because it's so hot and so dry there that they really they can't even figure out how they catch on fire. Things spontaneously combust. And if it's like a tumbleweed or a bush or something in that dry environment, that wouldn't be shocking to me. Be like, oh, crap. Yeah, it's hot and it's dry. Oh, guess I shouldn't have brought my father's flock out to this place that's so hot and so dry and probably doesn't have a lot of good grass for them to eat. That was probably a big mistake. Like supposedly the shepherd boy who led his flock over to the west middle side of the Dead Sea. For what? For all the good forage out there? where he discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ah, uh, yeah. Anyways, so I don't think there's that weird a thing. And, and the whole passage has got some wording to it that's a little weird, a little dubious there. People think, well, he was interested in it because it was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. And we've all seen the um, the way that that looks like in artists' interpretations, renditions, and all that stuff. It takes a while for actually a bush or anything to burn before you realize it's not being consumed. I don't know how long he would have had to have stood there gawking to figure out that a bush wasn't being consumed even though it was burning. Unless it was like thin, hollow grasses. How big is that? How you get somebody's attention. But there are other things that if he looked and he saw that they looked like they were on fire in the middle of them, that might get way more attention from him. And I'll tell you what those things might be based on a comparison of likely cognates to Sunne. So one of the simplest things that you can do if you're taking a look at a word and you want to get a good feel for what the actual definition and usage of that word ought to be, you can do this in eSword. You can just go to KJC tab in your lexicons, dictionaries, all that. And you can punch it in up here, the upper right. I'll take you to that word, show you occurrences, all of that. And you can, for one thing, click on it, use your your little arrows here, you can go up, you can see, well, let me see, I'm getting into Sambalat. Okay, well, I got to SM. So I've got Sanar, that's a name. Sambalat, that's a name. So let's go forward, Senna, that's a name. That's a name. Sanur, hmm, blindness journey. Interesting, but not as helpful as I'd like it to be. So the other thing you can do is go to, I also have the Strong's Obery list. All the key codes are at the beginning of this list. So it's, it's an English keyboard. You don't have to switch to another keyboard or anything like that. Use an English keyboard and you can try some very simple searches to see what cognates exist for it. You could try just SN, which mostly this word is SNE. You could try SNE and you could see what other words it occurs within. Try that. Mm -hmm. And we'll get some results here. 
Here's sine, 5572, which is what we were just at. And we tried a few other words besides that, so we'll just hit enter. It appears in hasane, one occurrence, which I probably won't go to right now because it's one occurrence. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm doing scene. I didn't change it yet. My fault. S N E. There we go. Now I've changed it. Let's see. There it is. There it is. And we have it in Sunsene, which I think we actually looked at, right? 5578? Nope. Go to. Oh, it's a name. And you know what? I wouldn't have known that if I wasn't rushing because I have these coded now. All of the proper names have a blue highlight on the number. All of the roots that are used in the uh, exhaustive obri by biglyph roots chart are completely highlighted in yellow. And I have that in the, um, what do you call it, the legend index. The index at the frontier, Kuritsune, that's also a proper name. That's why the, the blue highlighting is there. And you could try, no, that's a proper name. Try the next thing, and then we're back to Sine. But that's not the only thing you can do. If you understand that the E at the end is actually just a generalizing or feminizing suffix, you can try variations of sun with both the Y in the center, seen, or U in the center. And you can start seeing how those things are used. And I can make you a long story short. You're going to find, if you do this yourself, that occurrences of scene mostly have to do with um, first off the children of uh, Canaan or Canaan and the area that they lived in and the wilderness that Israel spends a good amount of time in between Mitzram and Canaan or Canaan. Um, is it named for those people in specific? It's hard to say because there is seen and there's seeny. You will also find uh, an occurrence where Jonathan, Saul's son, is trying to sneak up on the Pelishatim, or the Philistines. And there's a passage, and there's two large boulders. And he names one boulder, one thing, and he names another boulder, this Sine, or actually just Sin. Now, it's interesting that he names this boulder scene. It's also interesting that when you look at the characters or the glyphs themselves, the S usually has a lot to do with curving. I know that I still have the S right now in um, Obri Beta 3 as the, what looks kind of like a telephone pole because I saw a lot of that, but I actually actually am seeing more occurrences where it seems to have more of a curve to it like our modern s and most of the simple roots that it's in seem to have to do oftentimes with curving we see that even when it was changed by the masoretes they kept that form we see it also in koine greek of a curve it looks very much like a circle, in fact, in the Masoretic and Koine Greek. So anyways, when you consider the fact that boulders, like for instance, falling boulders, are cello, a round falling boulder. And then you connect this with other words that are like S-Y-N, S-U-N. It looks possibly more like a type of rock than a bush. And again, if we go back to the fact that the sene, S-N-E, is mostly only found in the context of Masha, Moses, seeing a thing that had a fire burning within it, and then that being referenced by him himself when blessing Joseph, we don't really have anything else to sort of compare it with. So to say it's a thorny bush, or to believe Brown Driver and Briggs that that's in fact the correct definition, is a real stretch. And then, if we go to, say, Blue Letter Bible and just do a general search, say on the word thorn, 
and we look at all the words that are actually translated as thorn at one point in time or another, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, we've got tw a dozen words. All translated as thorn at one time or another. It's quite a stretch. I think to say the least, it is quite a stretch. So then to compare these two definitions, which are highly dubious, to some New Testament passages in which we see, for instance, Matthew 7.16, By their fruits you shall know them are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. That may be a correct translation. And really just that maxim is pretty decent in general. Sure, because it illustrates that some things simply are as they are. And you're not going to get good fruit out of a bad tree. Okay, fine. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Hmm. Which we are talking about somebody who, you know, questions the veracity of Paul, and just absolutely fine, because using our powers of reason and deduction. Okay. And then he says, this is the part where he says that he was given a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan. So apparently something having to do with thorns has to be from Satan. And so we draw a conclusion to this. It's just, I have to say this in this way, it is just the worst sort of reasoning or deduction or logic. It's just the worst. The, the quality of, of this sort of um, comparative logic is quite bad. And again, I, you know, I may make another one comparing some of these other posts, because as I've, I've said, this is something that a lot of people have tried to make a case for, and it's a terrible case. I don't care who it is. Like I said, one of the simplest ways that you can figure out how weak it is as a case is just by taking all of those New Testament quotes <clears throat> finding that when you reference them in the Old Testament this same God that so many are calling Father is precisely the Yahweh that you see in the so-called Old Testament. Everything past that is details. They're important. But that's, in my mind, that's absolutely one of the simplest ways to just case closed. You have no case. So I'm sorry to see when this happens. And as I said, you know, I will treat it intellectually and take it seriously because of the influence that this sort of thing oftentimes has on people who aren't usually doing their own work to check it out to make sure whether it's correct or not. And I don't like to see people being misled. I get pretty upset about that. Furthermore, I don't like to see the God, Aliyim, that I do worship defamed in this way, slandered in this way. So, you know, I might make a, a part two on this. I may not. But I did want to address it because it does have important impact and I would say consequences. So until next time, see you later.